Buenas and good afternoon. The Committee on Education, Self-Determination and Historic Preservation Infrastructure, Border Safety, Federal and Foreign Affairs <clears throat> and Maritime Transportation will now convene for this hybrid community roundtable hearing. Regarding the historic, regarding the Guam Historic Resources Division, also known as the State Historic Preservation Office of the Department of Parks and Recreation. Today is Thursday, April 22nd, 2021, and it is currently 521 in the afternoon. Thank you for being here and all those on Zoom. I'm, I apologize, my apologies, we started a little bit late. For the record and in accordance with the open government law, public notices were sent out via email to all senators, stakeholders, and all main media broadcasting outlets on Wednesday, April 14th, 2021. And the second notice on Tuesday, April 20th, 2021. Notice of today's hearing was also available on the Guam Legislature's website. I'd like to thank my Vice Chair, Speaker Talahi, for being present and Senator Perez for being present with us today. Thank you, Senators. I'm going to read the general rules of conduct. This is specifically um, for those that are participating via Zoom. All must abide by the rules of conduct and quality assurance standards. Please keep video on at all times and ensure you are in a room with little interruptions and adequate lighting, specifically to make sure the participant's face is, face is visible at all times. The host of this hearing will mute participants until called upon by the chair. When called to speak, please ensure that you are unmuted and that you are speaking into your microphone. Questions and testimony shall be confined to the substance or nature of the agenda and personal inference as to the character or the motive of any senator or any individual testifying is not permitted. Any violations of this general rule of conduct will result in removal from the hearing by the host and by the Sergeant of Arms here in the public hearing room. I have called for this round table hearing to provide our community opportunity and outlet to share their voices and concerns in light of the discovery of Latte period, the Latte period, burial sites and human remains at Maguac village, which is also the site of the Marine Corps base Camp Laws. I hope everyone listening will have a better understanding of the significance of our cultural burial sites and ancestral remains and the guidelines and procedures for the preservation of these sites and remains, and the United Nations letter regarding human rights violations in Guam. The agenda for today is the importance of Chamorro ancestral remains, knowledge of documented Chamorro ancestral burials and location of burials, inputs on consent and authority for consultation under the 2011 programmatic agreement through legislative public hearings, and concerns addressing the National Historic Preservation Act and or any provisions in 36 CFR Part 800 and for dis further discussions on the United Nations Special Rapporteur Letter. We will now begin with a special uh, tribute, a special prayer done by Mr. Jeremy Cepeda uh, to pay homage to our ancestors who we recognize with sanctity and respect. And if all of us could please stand during the prayer. Thank you, Mr. Cepeda. Yes. This is Masilokwi. Aslena is a hululu, man motto ham gives a hogu sent to mekun. Na in gogogohau nu mina asetmo, zanisina guetmo. Send makasilang it zanitano, iman a anuk, zanitiman a anuk. Not fan ma ina ham nu mina lakmo, zana suha fan iti nailazi, ni mangai gives a hami. Not fan ma okti ham fan nu mina lekmo. Zanna i ham nui mi net gut, i mi nen halum, zani ni na sinya, na in na funazan, na in na funazan ni tetsu mami pogu. Umatuna hao ni tai hina kokasena e zahululu, miga ma asi, tai guana mohon. Pogu na tatuna si asana e zahululu, 
pagu tatuna i manenata. Lolotnya pagu i manenata ni man mahafut gui ni gi atsongyata gui ni zahakna nafan malof magi gita no mizu za mige ma asi namba baji ham no ita no mizu na cek gui ni. Manenan mami asi ifan loku ifan magu un mizu sab mat zau zau i haga sagan mi mizu. Tadz zuti ham nui manata tin mizu. Zan satsalani ham guatu gidi nansi na tsalan. Na fan makaba ihi nasun mami zani meng mong mami na isinya infan apa maulik mo na. Iza hululu infan tinina manyanan mami miga maasi tayo gwa na mohon. Za pagu bay atui inge lokuin na kadadak na lini. Na tafan hita, tafan etnon. Jangan tunggu sini hamzulu malai loko. Ini ni hamzu manyainan mami. Ini ni hamzu. Manyet lun mami Ineni Iman mofot nai guiham Ineni Man mo fort na igwiham ine ni hamzu man yai nan mami ine ni hamzu. Manyet lun mami Inne ni Iman mofot nai guiham Inne ni Iman mo fort na iguha talo ine ni hamzu manyay nan mami ine ni hamzu manyet lun mami. Inne ni iman mo fort na iguham. Inne ni iman mo fort na iguham. Miga masi. Thank you, Jeremy. That was, that was very beautiful. <laughs> okay, so we are going to proceed for those that are listed here in our round table to give testimony. Um, what I'd like to do first, there are some of um, individuals who, are, who will be tes testifying that um, will need to leave right away because they have other engagements. So. We're going to go through that and then we will then transition from a face-to-face -face here in the public hearing room and then we will transition to Zoom. So first we're gonna call uh, former Senator Hope Cristobal uh, to speak and then attorney Mike Phillips via Zoom. Zoom will, will have the opportunity to follow. Senator. Jesus Masih Senadora put istina putunya dah. Ipera tafan etnun 
ze paret a no i ha informacion zen tinenguen ni paret a considera por i na taka todun ni manjainata manjeluta ni zimen maso soda pagu zen mahaha uf kita no zen mahaha sa zen donklusiana dinis respetu ni guaguha Si zus ma si todu ham zus in nga Dora Nelson, kikwintus Therese Terlahi, si nga Dora Sabina Perez. I will share my experiences with dealing with the burials and hopefully make some recommendations. Senadora Nelson Zantoro Hamzugi Comité ni estimina 86 na legislatura. Esta zu para 75 años, za 20 ti atmamam tempoku zanginta considera todo i ina tsaka kuncha i manzamoru guini na tanu. Todo i ina reglamentota put finata i zanlinala guini na tanu man madiroga. Ma su planta i a reglamentun hinengi, i na dahi zan respetu, i tiningu pur i na dahi ni mata i mataita, i respetu para i manjainata genin todu gi komunidad, i a reglamentun i na dahi ni tanu, i tasi, i bakona, i kantun tasi in matingan, esti siha i besita pa guna tempu man mas ma gasguini. Honorable Senator Nelson and members of the committee this year, I turn, I turn quarters of a century. During this lifetime, I spent over half advocating for respect for our dead. Our own people, our ancestors held both public and private rites and rituals for our dead. The dead is honored, kept close to the family, protected, respected by the entire community. We believe that we have our body, our soul, our auntie, or animas, but we also have our spirit, referred to as the aniti. Our anitis are sacred, we venerate them. They are powerful and we believe we can invoke them to help us. And of course, anitis could also do harm from maltreatment, desecrations, defilements. My Nanambiha taught me that if we disturb the burials of our Achafnyak or our Manyainas, we disturb their rest state, that their spirits are in a disturbed state, and we have a responsibility to rebury or place them back where they are buried for eternity. While in a disturbed state, the Anitis can do harm in our rituals, we pray and ask forgiveness for those who do the deed. One of the first hotels in Guam, I believe it was the Royal Hotel, was built in 1968 in Ipau. Ipau was the hometown of Hirao, and obviously the sacred burial grounds of the residents are located there. Hirao assisted Matapang in defending our Tautautanu and our Linala in 1671 during the height of the Chamorro Spanish Wars. I was there in 1968 to observe the groundbreaking and heard stories about burials that were desecrated during the ground preparations. I recall the shock expressed by my elders when I came home it was a huge violation of Chamorro belief system. The dead must be left in their sacred burial grounds and that we have a responsibility to go there, to reconsecrate, to pray, and bury the human remains of our people. For me and my elders, it was the honorable and respectable thing to do. The Anitis, or Chamorro spirits, will return to their resting place. The relatively new discipline of archaeology was engaged in the desecrations of Chamorro human remains at Matapang Beach in 1985. The government of Guam had decided that instead of relocating the ponding basin for an adjacent hotel building, that it was the burials that had to be removed. 
Using backhoe archaeology, burials were dug up and exposed. My family elders, Dr. Bennett Kamatsudunka and I, we organized a kind of a re-consecration ceremony for the burials, hoping that the contractor, the responsible parties, and the government of Guam will have respect for the dead. Hundreds gathered at Tomhom Church for Mass, and we processed to Matapang as demonstration of our community's respect and request to preserve Chamorro burial grounds. Then Marian Leon Guerrero, who owned the adjacent piece of property, was there expressing her strong objections of the backhoe equipment and the noise and the desecration of the burials. The Archbishop blessed the graves with exposed human remains in hopes that our community's desire for true preservation will be upheld. Lo and behold, the burials were removed and the sand was mined for Adelope's new facility. The plans for a ponding basin did not change. It was Armaninus that had to be desecrated and defiled to make way for a ponding basin. That was the standard back then. That is what is at Matapang Beach today. There is absolutely nothing about the desecrated human beings that were buried there and later removed, nothing about the history of that place it is gone and effaced from the earth. Whose responsibility is it to remember this place for our children? How do those responsible for its protection and preservation render such a scandal to the people? Have they no respetu? Have they no humanity? Man tai respetu. In 1991, a group of us concerned tomorrows were disturbed enough to take the Nico Hotel to the Superior Court for the desecrations and defilement of our ancestral Manainas at Goknya. What you now call Gun Beach is Goknya. We were willing to lose our few assets put up as collateral in order to take the huge hotel corporation to court to stop the desecrations. We were able to obtain an injunction on the construction we were able to negotiate the placement of the reinterment of 161 Chamorro residents at the front yard of the hotel. Because of our belief of the sacredness of our Chamorro burials and the spirits of our ancestors, their remains must be preserved in situ and the burial site preserved in perpetuity to our Chamorro people and our community to continue to pay our respects for our dead ancestors. My mother, Francisca Tamanglu Navarro Alvarez, Tano and his dad, Alejandro Lezama, Bernadita Ogden Hernandez, Ronald Frank Estijan, Maria Cristobal, and myself were at the Guam Superior Court, and I provide a photo um, of us receiving the court injunction to stop the construction in 1991. Not too much later, the Hyatt Hotel desecrated some 524 Chamorro burials on their site. The powerful tourist industry began scrambling to hide the heinous defilements of our sacred ancestral burial grounds. This hotel conducted its own Buddhist ceremony and reburied the human remains at their front garden with an 18-inch pedestal without any information about their heinous deed on our manainas. The government of Guam must take responsibility for its lack of policy and enforcement to protect our ancestors. But these huge corporations must be taught respect. They must be made to build respectable monuments with all significant detail information about our ancestral burials. They must be made to respect our people. Shortly thereafter, hundreds of burials at the old town of Natun were desecrated. The community was outraged. Natun 
is the hometown of Matapang, our hero Magalahi, who defended our people and our Linatla. It is where the Aurora Resort is now located. Because the public access for this hotel is located along the burial sites, archaeologist David Defont threatened to sue us activists for, quote, unquote, moving the exposed artifacts at his project site. Public access was a narrow sliver of land, land that apparently still held burials. Who owns our ancestors' remains? Their funerary objects, their burials. How should our ancestors' remains be treated when they are found on private property? It did not seem that the government of Guam had established guidelines then. At this point in time, the government of Guam was collaborating with the hotels, hired archaeologists, and information was basically being kept from the community, just like it's being done today. RKO business was flourishing in Tuman during the tourist startup. Hotels were basically digging, desecrating, and removing our ancestral remains. Science became more important than respeto for our community and from our community. It was difficult to keep track without the cooperation of the government of Guam. The next thing I found out was that the shippo had agreed to ship off burial remains in boxes for study abroad. This was unacceptable and to me disrespectful. Community input was limited to historic preservations, officers' public meetings, but was not widely disseminated. Bula tinailaji gininifina pusiha putite lang imanyainata. We see the same thing occurring today with the military doing the exact same thing as the hotels did in Tomhum. What happened at Magwa will continue to happen unless the government of Guam steps up and protects burials from desecration, from being defiled and removed from their final resting place. We must insist that all burial grounds be preserved in perpetuity for the Chamorro people anywhere in Guam. We have the right to pay respects to our ancestors at their burial grounds. Idaretsu ni mansamoru ginini man mafanyaguta fona zan fiet gininas zu ustata imas fundamentu zan mas takalum figo na irensia lo hazi umalalaba iznamak. I recommend the shonhu na guahalai para uma establesi itsamoru burial council. Si hadebi ufan manoi pribilehu para umana hudzung reglamento pudi sinat bantodu i burial grounds in aftani manainata siha. If nenina na reglamento i ma proteheni urihinot na naftan zan uma dibotu adzuna lugar para finatun i tautautanu para gineptin i respetu. Bula Ideha Sempre Ni Praesti Itzamoru Burial Council. Apparently, um, there has been a draft already of this uh, some years ago, and I would urge the committee to take a look at this again and see where we can um, make it work for us. Sincero Zan Magahi, Guahu Si Ho Cristobo, Sidzus Masi, for your uh, allowing me to testify first. Dankuna Sidzus Masi, Antio. Now we'll transition to Zoom and um, give Mike, uh, Attorney Mike Phillips the opportunity to give testimony. Is he there? Attorney Phillips, are you there? No, okay, so then we will move on to the next one would be, sorry, Mrs. Bernie Hernandez via Zoom. 
There you are. Good afternoon, Mrs. Hernandez. Please go ahead and provide your testimony and state your, your name for the record. Today, Senator Nelson, Speaker Therese Terlahi, and members of the Committee on Historic Preservation and Self-Determination. I am Bernadita Uggen Hernandez, originally from the village of Mola, Familian Chia, and Familian Sala. I am an educator with 43 years of experience in the Department of Education and in private schools. I am a longtime member of the Organization of Peoples for Indigenous Rights and its advocacies. Thank you for the opportunity to present my position statement on the importance of our Chamorro ancestral remains burial grounds. Sub cemeteries of our 17th century Chamorro village of Mamba, recently disturbed by the Department of Defense, the US military. During their bulldozing and clearing of Mabuk Village, damaging the surface of the village grounds itself, thus confirming the existence of our Chamorro villages in the areas of US military destruction. A recent discovery of a Jesuit order, 1676 map of Juan, shows not only the 17th century Song Song Magua and its location, but all of the villages of our homeland nation during this period of time. The unearthing of our ancestral remains in their centuries old villages of Magua has major significance to our Chamorro heritage and education perspective. They are as follows. Number one, the Chamorro ancestral remains in the village of Magua and other villages like Latecton, Aputo, Inapsan, and Telagi were Chamorro villages at war with Spain in the 17th century. Number two, Spanish colonization of Guam was illustrated in the Jesuit records which revealed our Chamorro forefathers rejected the subjugation of all of the islands of the Chamorro archipelago. In that Chamorro Spanish war, the Spaniards utilized European war methods of total destruction of the enemy, us. Three, the ancestral remains found in the, is the evidence of our forefathers from Magua villages struggle and died during Spanish colonization. Number four, the 1676 map showing our past nation's villages and now uninhabited reveals the extent of the unrecognized genocide that occurred during the 17th century committed by the Spaniards. Why? Today, these villages, these villages are uninhabited along with the other villages of Northern Guam, as I said earlier. These villagers were not colonized when they died. And these villages were vibrant communities of our Chamorro civilization that was self-sufficient. Number five. The reaction of my Chamorro friends and family in the publicized military desecration of the village and the re human remains is traumatic. And the blatant total disrespect of my answers cemeteries and their village homes is utterly unacceptable. It is an atrocity again, wherein today, the physical destruction 
of the evidence of the existence of Archimoro villages by the US military is a continuation of the genocide committed by the colonizers of the 17th century Spain. Number six, the disrespect of the remains of our heritage, our ancestral remains by desecration and destruction is a recurring policy that is bordering on unacceptable bias towards us, the Chamorro people of Guam, the indigenous people of the Chamorro Archipelago. Number seven, it appears to me that the regulatory process used by the US military, the section 106 process, was never intended to be used as a weapon to legitimize the destruction of our Chamorro heritage. To construct facilities whose mission is to be for the defense of American democracy in the home nation, homeland nation of the Chamorro people. It is done without our consent. Firstly, the Chamorro people's right was violated by using the regulatory process to usurp our rights to consent first to the remilitarization of our homeland and the exclusion of the Chamorro people in the decision to remilitarize our homeland is un-American, especially when the decision to do so was in collusion with a country that committed the heinous atrocities to the Chamorros of Guam in World War II, the nation of Japan. Number eight, it's disconcerting that the US military is barring indigenous Chamorros like myself and other Chamorros to access the remains of our ancestors found in the old 17th century Chamorro village of Magla. So we can solemnly respect those spirits that have been des desecrated by construction and destruction. Number nine, Chamorro access to the site to perform burial practices and ceremonies of Chamorro culture is significant, or sorry, cultural significance has been denied. It shouldn't be hard to convince those in charge that the request for burial ceremonies by the Chamorro indigenous rights representatives is the right thing to do out of respect for us, the Chamorro people, and in genuine spirit of enough and more. A failure by the US military in providing information so that the Chamorro culture of respecting the dead can be practiced is bordering on unacceptable bias, bordering on discrimination towards the Chamorro people's culture. My recommendation, A, return the lands of Mugwag village to the Chamorro people of Guam and all villages endangered by the US military destruction. B, consider terminating the programmatic agreement and stop the continued destruction of the villages of Magwak and adjacent villages. C, stop the discriminating treatment of our Chamorro ancestral remains. D, protect and preserve all of the 17th century villages of Aputo, Metexan, Inapsan, by placing them in a historic district zone for their protection. Most especially the place of Magwak Village and place Magwak Village on the Guam Register for Historic Places immediately. E, seize the clearing, cease the clearing activity of Magwak Village and access the impact and damages this clearing will have on our Northern aquifer, our water of life. F, consider that the government of Japan 
as a member of the United Nations to help stop the violation of two moral rights by their, by their allies, the United States of America, as embodied in the UN Rappaport Report. Thank you for the opportunity to present my position on this matter. Thank you, Mrs. Hernandez. Um, I would, if I may request that we limit our testimony to five minutes, and because um, I, we seem to have a growing list of people who would like to testify, so if we can take that into consideration. But definitely we want to hear what the community has to say, and so that we can actually move forward, perhaps working on policy, working on um, a greater transparency within the SHPO, and so we can definitely move forward to protecting the rights of the people who are indigenous to this land. So at this time, we're going to recognize Mr. Dave Lotz to proceed with his testimony. And thank you, thank you, Dave, for being here. Please go ahead and state your name for the record. Thank you. I'm Dave Lotz, a resident of Chigo. I certainly support the previous testimony and my written testimony that I submitted is relative to the 2020 programmatic agreement, but it is very indicative of the problems that we see. This MIT programmatic agreement does not sufficiently document the Section 106 review process that is a three-step process of one, describing the undertaking, two, describe the historic properties to be affected, and assess the adverse effects. Uh, and I, I am paraphrasing some of my written statement. Uh, incredibly, the programmatic agreement vaguely states that the undertaking may potentially affect historic properties. This is just an incredible statement for a representative of the people of Guam, the Guam Shippo to sign off on. The responsibilities for involving the public is with the federal agency and not the Shippo, according to Section 106 requirements. The rationale why the Guam Shippo has assumed a legal obligation of the Navy is not known, but this does create a question of the Guam Shippo compromising their role, the objectivity of a review, and lack of representation of the interests of the people of Guam. Their attempt for public input at a last moment was clearly inadequate, lacked any meaningful review, not held in a forum for meaningful discussion, and seriously late in the process. In effect, the programmatic agreement was crafted in public. There, third, there is no provision for SHPO and staff to provide direct oversight of mid activities such as observing the training and inspection of historic sites. The SHPO is not responsible, I'm sorry, the SHPO is thus dependent on reports from the Navy. I'll further add that the public is completely excluded from any participation in the programmatic agreements, this is participating in annual meetings. Incredibly, this MIT programmatic agreement does not capture all military training on or around Guam. Fifth, the programmatic agreement makes reference to terms such as best management practice and cultural sensitive training with no definition of that meaning. Even though these concepts hey, have merit, I think it's incredible that these were not incorporated in the military activities on Guam decades ago. I have some follow-up points I'd like to make in addition to what was made uh, in that testimony. And this is initially is regarding to burials. Unfortunately, it's all too evident, as particularly my predecessors in this testimony indicated very disrespectful and it is more towards notification and not regarding appropriate treatment which to me should be leaving those remains in place. 
MAGA IS CERTAINLY A GOOD INDICATION OF WHAT HAS HAPPENED. UNFORTUNATELY, THE DESTRUCTION OF MAGA WAS ACTUALLY SANCTIONED IN A PROGRAMMATIC AGREEMENT AND REFLECTS TERRIBLE PLANNING, WHEREAS THE BASE, IF YOU SUBSCRIBE TO A THEORY THAT THE BASE SHOULD BE BUILT, WHICH I DO NOT, COULD HAVE SUBSTANTIALLY AVOIDED MAGA. I ALSO CALL TO YOUR ATTENTION, EVEN THOUGH I DO NOT FEEL THIS WILL RESOLVE THE ISSUE, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act of 1990 does not include the people of Guam or the Northern Marianas or Samoa in the Pacific. It does include uh, Native Americans in the mainland, um, the uh, Native indigenous people of Alaska and Native Hawaiians. I think this needs to be looked at. When we talk preservation, there are four components of preservation. First one is preservation, rehabilitation, restoration, and reconstruction. What we've seen now, salvage archeology, span the removal of artifacts and human remains is just not historic preservation. All too often we've seen these dealings done in secret and even misusing a federal law relative to informing the people of Guam regarding what should be information available to us. SHPO has an obligation to be transparent and lead the efforts to protect our heritage. The secrecy involved hides the destruction of our heritage. Knowledge and appreciation leads to protection. Both programmatic agreements of 11 and 20 simply do not preserve our heritage, abdicate our responsibilities, and lack of public involvement. I would also question whether either our acting SHPO or the current SHPO, now absent, has any adequate training on Section 106. There is training available for Section 106. And in order to put you yourself in a proper position to negotiate, you need to understand the ramifications of Section 106. It is one of the few aspects that we, the people of Guam, a colony of the United States, have the ability to negotiate with the military as truly equal. We need to be assertive in dealing with the military, as I've just said, one of the few opportunities. I also need to express my concern that the position of Guam State Historic Preservation Officer is mandated by Guam Law 21 GCA 77302 to be a classified position in the Department of Parks and Recreation. I do not know whether the current SHPO or acting SHPO meet this requirement. I think this is important because any document signed by the person who did not occupy that position legality can be questioned. We need to have our preservation policies based upon a historic preservation mandate contained in 21 GCA 76101, which simply calls for, for preservation. And when we talk preservation with Magua, that's a broad cultural landscape. I'm going to end with Magua because it is quite possibly or was the last reasonably intact upland limestone plateau Chamorro village in all of the islands. Uh, prior ones were lost on Rhoda, Tinian, and Saipan, principally due to the Japanese sugarcane plantations and also American military. There was a facility, I'm sorry, a village site further south in the area now called South Finnegajan, the only thing that was saved in the 70s was a lattice set that you can still see but not maintain. Other aspects of this were apparently still there but were bulldozed. So sadly, from a preservation point of view, uh, we lost an awful lot with Magua. And very simply, if you look at the maps, a cursory review of the maps from hundreds of years ago and into the 1900s, Magua was clearly identified. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lotz, for your testimony. And now we'll move on to Senator Kelly Marsh-Tanitsuno. 
seine Maasi. Hafede, Senadora Nelson, Maskehalu Terlahi, Zen, Senadora Perez. The U.S. has an appalling history of treating indigenous and other non white peoples within its claimed borders, which to degrees includes the communities of its possessions who are of secondary or tertiary consideration, if considered at all. We cannot go back and change that history, but we can call for justice in addressing the past and in our path forward. This call for consideration must be what guides us on Guam. After World War II, land taking swelled federal holdings to over 60% of the island. For months, these land takings lacked any compensation. And when finally forced to do so, the compensation was far below market value. At the same time, the island's landscape was transformed as never before. Tens of thousands of acres that hadn't been destroyed in the American softening of the island and invasion were bulldozed, scraping specialized native and endemic flora and precious ancestral and historical heritage off the face of this earth. For the Northern Plateau alone, military activities from that time to now have caused the ancestral village of Tulagi to no longer exist, to make way for a military recreation area. The majority of the ancestral village of Letexen was also destroyed, again, for a military recreation area. The settlement of Tailalo is being actively destroyed to be desecrated with the continued sound of 6.7 million bullets being expended a year, shot at a military live fire range complex. The traces of Mogwak are be currently being bulldozed and essentially all traces of it are being removed to make way for parking lots and facilities with no real consideration of leaving existing portions of it in place. Primeval forests were raised for military expediency, in particular, the tall, beautiful Ephod and Serianthus trees were cut down everywhere shortly after the war, along with other tall tree varieties. Military bulldozers piled brush into huge piles, which were burned and blanketed Guam with smoke for weeks from the great bonfires. Those trees never made a comeback. While this heritage has always been sacred and invaluable, we are now at a point where some of the last representations of ancestral lifeways and the special balance which keeps our ecosystems and us healthy are at stake. The military must be proactive. They must be transparent. They must improve their communications with our government agencies and the people. I have observed build-up actions both from the outside and the inside for over a decade. Each of these areas on their part is grossly lacking. We, the local government, are leaders must hold the federal government to standards of proactivity, transparency, and openness that our community deserves. In calling for those standards, we cannot keep one eye open on the local government, but shut the other eye when it comes to the federal government. They have missions and objectives. They are comprised of humans who are fallible. Federal laws are imperfect and lacking. It is irresponsible to make the assumption that these realities don't exist. It also seems to be, in assessing their work over the years, that federal errors are becoming larger and more blatant. Calls for public comment are occurring without maps, 
without full detail and with contradictory information. Ignoring community concerns, putting their head down and carrying on as if we had said nothing at all, as if our rights don't matter, cannot continue. The Guam Historic Preservation Office is comprised of personnel who have decades of experience. Given the size of the task before them, the immensity of the military buildup and the massive amounts of continuous associated training and testing, it is imperative that they seek additional expertise through consultants, archaeologists, and technicians. The people of Guam must also be encouraged to consider careers in protecting that which is finite and irreplaceable. That which, once gone, will never be as it was. Removing a burial, disassembling a tzahan, bulldozing a ladi quarry area, all of which have happened at Magwak, will never exist as Imanautal Mutna had once placed them or used them. Each are losses for the Chamorro people and all the generations forevermore. A typical HPO in a state, so I've been told, which is not undergoing the level of military buildup that we are, is comprised of about uh, perhaps 35 personnel, each holding master's degrees and PhD. We have just nine or so personnel, one of whom is an archeologist with a master's degree. On one hand, they are overwhelmed and each day is probably a struggle to maintain daily operations. On the other hand, we need a plan of action from the HPO that outlines how they will modernize their processes so that they are more efficient and effective and how they will grow their expertise to ensure that the Chamorro people and we, the larger community, are given the regulation and protection we deserve. Without these actions, our community will continue to lose. The United Nations has recognized through resolution and through inquiry that we who call Guahan home live on an indigenous homeland. Indigenous peoples have special connections to the land, sea, and all that live within them which are to be recognized. While we are a possession working towards self-determination, the US is an administering authority given a sacred trust to not destroy the resources belonging to the indigenous people. And yet here we are, seeing thousands of more acres bulldozed, seeing ancestral burials disturbed, and seeing some of the last of certain ancestral heritage destroyed or removed. We are seeing rare and threatened native and endemic species that took millennia to develop here, being cut down, demolished, and sometimes transplanted by federal authorities who continue to state that they are being good stewards of the land. Historic preservation laws are complex and multidimensional, and certainly they need to be improved. The activities our community are contending with are part of the largest peacetime buildup ever. We must expect our historic preservation office to advocate for what is morally right, and not just for compliance, for whatever imperfect minimal standards exist in law. To do as Thank you, Senator, Senator Marsh Titano. We'll now transition into receiving testimony via Zoom, and we'll start with Joni Kerr. Is there Joni Kerr there? Yes, I'm here. Oh. Thank you. Papa Day, Senadora Nelson, Speaker Teresa Lahi, and Senadora Sabina Perez fellow residents of Guam and Chamorros of the diaspora. I'm Joni King Kerr. I teach uh, introductory marine biology and chemistry at Guam Community College. And I am also an advisor of the Eco Warriors. 
So this is a, a student and, and community organization that has um, been involved in uh, protecting our natural resources for the last nine years. And we have also been um, involved in protesting the destruction of pristine limestone forests to build the live fire training range at Retidian or Talalu. So on behalf of the GCC Equal Warriors and as a Chamorro, a teacher and a scientist, I am concerned that the people of Guam have been dealt great and grave losses in the military buildup process. As a colony of the US, we have been unfairly treated and will bear the losses for generations to come. I applaud the, the previous speakers um, giving testimony because I think they've covered a lot of bases. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, um, kind of talk about the ones, the concerns, the main concerns that I have. Um, I, I'm a teacher and as a teacher, I appreciate information and I gather information and I transmit that information to my students. And, um, and even though I teach marine biology, we do start out the semester with talking about uh, the Chamorros, the, the, um, uh, the science of navigation. Um, we talk about how they use the land, how they use about, about exactly what they did. Um, and so any little bit of information that we can get from studying um, the sites where they lived, um, um, looking at their burial sites, cleaning any, any little bit of information that they had, that to me is very precious and invaluable. It's information treasure. And that, that treasure can become part of our curriculum, our consciousness. And it's what makes us tomorrow's unique and special. So, so that is something that I'm, I'm very concerned about, that we're losing um, a lot of information in the military's haste to build this, um, the base and this marine base and, to, and this firing range. Um, it raises suspicions, the rapidity of this pace it raises suspicions that not enough care has been taken to carefully document and study burial sites. And don't there's such a lack of transparency by the military, Gov Guam, and the Shippo, the person delegated with the responsibility of representing the people, protecting their interests, and above all, protecting the sites of historical and cultural significance. The acting SHPO appears to misunderstand the role of the this, this will reflects the interests of the state and its citizens in the preservation of their cultural heritage. The SHPO advises and assists federal agencies in carrying out their Section 106 responsibilities. historic properties are taken into consideration at levels of planning and engagement. Um, I'm further concerned that the, the acting SHPO is distributing information about the burial sites in a piecemeal fashion and even has rejected a Freedom of Information Act request. By both, um, prote that protects information about the location and character or ownership of historic properties from public disclosure when disclosure could result in a significant invasion of privacy damage to the historic property or impede the use of a traditional religious site by practitioners that this of course doesn't make any sense because i mean unless the acting ship o is protecting the privacy of the military and fears that draws my damage these sites i mean it just it's just insulting. It's insulting to our people and to our, our intelligence. Um, finally, I was kind of um, relieved that, that Dave Locks mentioned uh, adverse effects because I'm not a section 106 expert, but um, in the case of Mogwek, this area that was inhabited by our, our ancestors and used well, apparently, um, I think it fits the criteria of adverse effects. And I think that um, 
in one of the sections there, adverse effects may include reasonably foreseeable effects caused by the undertaking that may occur later in time, be farther removed in distance, or be cumulative. Archaeologist Mike Carson has stated that Magwa clearly has or had more sites than previously anticipated. And so I can only surmise that we have lost much information treasure due to the military's haste to build the marine base. And I would venture that this loss constitutes an adverse effect and should be pursued as such. Finally, I am concerned that the current SHPO has a conflict of interest in being concurrently employed by the US military. Military culture obliges its personnel to be deferent to superiors. And I cannot be assured that Mr. Lujan can truly represent the people of Guam as long as he is employed by the federal agency that he is supposed to oversee. In closing, the GCC Equaris commend Senator Dora Nelson for holding this hearing, and I hope that it will help to raise awareness of what we are losing, and especially what we can do to prevent further destruction of our cultural and natural resources. Sina Maasi. Thank you very much, Mrs. Kerr. She was the first Zoom one, right? She was the first Zoom? Yes, right, okay. Thank you for your testimony, Mrs. Kerr. We appreciate that. We're now gonna move on to Rick Paris, who is also on Zoom. Good evening, Senator uh, Nilsson, Senator Paris, and Speaker Kalahi. Uh, my name is Rick Paris, and I'm providing testimony and descriptive opinions on uh, what's taking place. And I took a look at the PA and wanted to try to add some insights and we'll, we'll try not to repeat anything and I'll be short. Um, our ancient uh, tomorrow civilization and people are not fully represented in the words and content of the final PA document. The word tomorrow is only mentioned once in the PA document under Appendix B, Step 4. The document hardly talks about what specific environmental damages are taking place and will take place uh, to extend into the sea and undersea space near the island. Of note, the military is obligated to meet PA stipulations contingent upon receiving money from an unnamed appropriated funding source. That was a, a pulled out of the PA statement. So it, it, they don't even identify the appropriation they're using to fund the PA related work. Uh, subsection four of, final, of the final PA states that information and maps listed on Appendix A do not require additional review or discussion for PA document purposes which is of significance because the mapping, the quality of the mapping is horrible. Um, looking at uh, Navy Base Guam, they have 20 categories. They have uh, 19 PowerPoint pictures. None of the maps are consistently scaled. Same thing with the Air Force. None of the maps are consistently scaled. Uh, the Navy uh, provides 20 categories presenting training activities tied to various locations across 163 rows uh, on this part of the PA, 157 icons are categorized as authorized military training actions and are listed without definition. Stated mitigation measures by the Navy are vague and unclear and do not convey a level of confidence to show that anything of lasting substance was agreed upon by our people and the military. Um, and so that's just a, a slice of that. Uh, furthermore, uh, the PA document does not spell out what kinds, amounts, and levels of pollution, crash, chemical liquid or solid waste that will be produced from each listed activity and how it may specifically introduce or reintroduce human health risks and risks to human well-being. There is no language that explains where the underground aquifer system is in relation to each training area location, nor is there any content explaining the risks associated with nearby military actions, contamination and storm runoff management challenges and situations. There is no specific language that clearly spells out risk, fire risks, specific risks to military personnel, and specific risks to villagers. There is no language discussion specific cumulative destruction, damage, dangers, or risks to human and native species and ecosystems, including freshwater resources. There's an absence of first, second, and third order consequences. There are no glossaries in the documents providing definitions. Um, and the compliance documents that the Navy says in its Appendix C that represent the stated belief 
that the signing and implementation of the PA has satisfied sections 106 and 110 Foxtrot, um, it, it, they're overly extensive. They talk about the 210 Merck, 215 MITT and the 220 MITT, both on the, uh, on the supplemental and, and the regular uh, EIS statements. Not one government of Guam laws in, is referenced or mentioned outside of step four in appendix B, ma'am, and not one locally produced method to address villager or pescador concerns is outlined or identified in the PA. If a PA can be established, then maybe another document can be prepared to help fill the voids and gaps with substantially more focus on the concerns of our ancient Tomoro Pacific Islander civilization and our reef and beyond reef undersea areas extending miles out. This entire document, along with the underlying assumptions that has informed its preparation, need to be scrutinized once again, along with all the referenced appendices and major additional documents cited, which make up thousands of pages. This document, however, and, and this is key in terms of military thinking, can be used to sow frustration amongst ourselves. It can be used to sow higher levels of confusion. It can be used to, to create hopelessness and it can be used to further discourage our people from trying to really understand what is going on based on how the PA has been presented and legitimized not only by Comnav Mar, but by the Pentagon and also ironically by the government of Guam. It is a document in which references cited and listed are very extensive, containing language that is unclear, vague, and may hold multiple meanings. The Guam legislature, however, has a tremendous series of opportunities to leverage and further ex exert its collective strength and political power by setting up additional community meetings to further demystify this PA while generating a unity of effort to reach out to, the, to other folks, both locally and nationally. I would argue this document is one of military governmental triumphalism because it is framed and organized to fully benefit the military peppered with euphemisms at an extreme cost to our local Tomorrow people who ironically are very patriotic overall and who have already uh, provided blood tax and, and there has been so much dispossession. I would say the last uh, comment I would like to say is that this destruction is disproportionate. It represents cultural objectification and Tomorrow dis dispossession with cumulative effects to human and damage and destruction based on decisions made ironically, in response to the 1995 rape, a gang rape, by two Marines and one sailor on a 12-year-old girl walking home from middle school, who was later raped and then dumped and discarded on a field, which caused a tremendous amount of backlash, which resulted in the political decision to consider moving HQ Marines over to, from 3rd third, uh, third Marine, 3rd uh, Meth over to Guam, but mo most of the Marines are coming to Guam who are not gonna be coming from Oki. They're gonna be coming as unit deployed Marines from CONUS. So um, I just applaud you, Senator Nilsson, Senator Trelawney and Senator Paris for your leadership and your courage. And I think uh, this document is used in very uh, many ways that are deceptive and, and intended to, uh, to produce uh, hopelessness, fear, discouragement and confusion to do small safe. Thank you, Rick, for your testimony. Now we will trans transition back to face to face and we will call on Dietrich. Go ahead and state your name for the record. <laughs> Can't pronounce the last name. Half a day, Senator Nelson, Senator Paris, Senator Talahi. Put para Hamzu, i ni man membro i lihes laturan. Na put i ni na ni na saunau mizu i ni na ina dingan. Za ekunguk toru i na sunmami pakunahani. I na nu si Dietrich John ulukoa tu hilansut. Familien Guerrero Balhajia Mesa Manbus and familien bitut. I'd like to just say thank you, first of all, for allowing us the time to, to uh, share our thoughts. Uh, please let me know when I reach my four minute, 50 second mark. And also, may I recommend that we fly in uh, sign uh, Rick Paris when it comes time to re-review that uh, programmatic agreement. 
we really took that apart. So I'd just like to uh, offer two main recommendations um, that i like to suggest regarding um, the whole process of protecting our ancestral remains um, and then also our cultural sites. To clarify, I have a lot of recommendations. There are a lot of things I would like to fix regarding the process, but I'll just focus on two and we can talk after. The two are mainly uh, burial council and uh, consultation. And I've been an archeologist for about 10 years, working for a private firm in Hawaii. And so I wanted to share what is done regarding ancestral remains and the burial council there. Not to compare, but to say what is possible. And perhaps that can show light, uh, show a way of how we might be able to do things better. So there's a burial council for each of the islands or counties. Uh, generally speaking, nine members. And these members, there's a member representing each district. And you also have the interests, a member representing uh, the interests, up to three members representing the interests of a large landowner. So there's some kind of balance uh, and or a developer. Anytime uh, ancestral remains are found, automatically you call the burial council. Shippo, in Hawaii we call it Shipdi, Historic Preservation Division, Shippo will consult with the burial council. Shippo will not make any decisions regarding our ancestral remains without consulting with the burial council. The burial council, in turn, they're the ones who are going to seek out descendants. Two kinds of descendants, lineal descendants, cultural descendants. A lineal descendant means... I can trace my genealogy to that burial. A cultural descendant means the remains are in this district or near this village, and I can trace my ancestry to that village. Both lineal descendants and cultural descendants are invited to the table to share their thoughts on how to protect these ancestral remains. Not just Shippo and a developer, which in this case might be the military, might be a hotel, it might be the government wanting to widen Salankantuntasi. No matter where the burial is found, the burial council is going to call upon descendants and they're going to, the whole point is to make it a collaborative process to allow everyone to have a voice. You cannot expect everyone to have a voice when you only have Shippo and the military or Shippo and the developer deciding what to do with the burials. Anyone can tell you that's wrong. That's not representative of everyone. There's another thing, there are several other things regarding uh, burial council and I wanted to touch upon um, The, the claim, the claim to the claim to ancestral remains, also the claim to ethnicity. If someone says that, oh, uh, Tan Hope says, oh yeah, my my mother said that there were burials, you know, over there in that area, you know, nearly Texan, you know, or if. Uh, that Lou, uh, Jeremy Cepeda says, oh, my great-grandfather told me there were burials at Matapeng. That oral or written testimony, that counts. We don't need DNA tests. We don't have to go the extra mile and prove to the developer because we did the DNA test that, oh yeah, that is in fact Chamorro remains. Because we are an oral people. 
we pass down these stories and so we accept it unless there's some you know unbelievable reason why we need to say that that's okay that's definitely not Chamor remains so there are other ways to proceed regarding taking care of our ancestral remains obviously the status quo is not working it is unfair it is not right it is unjust I, I also understand that politics might get involved. There are ways to go around it. You know, whether the borough council members are appointed and they need to be approved by the legis legislature or uh, the mayors of each village, they appoint one person anytime our ancestral remains are found in their village and that person is the one that goes out and contacts the people. Maybe the people of each village, they get to vote for their burial council member and people uh, you know, run for it for two years, three years, four years. There are ways to go, but, but politics aside, um, it's, it's, it's more dangerous not to do anything about it and to allow it to go as is. It's not working. Now regarding consultation, uh, a few people mentioned uh, consultation. Practically everyone mentioned consultation up to now. Consultation means allowing the people to have a voice, right? One thing I noticed that's missing from uh, archaeological reports that I've seen thus far here is I don't see enough cultural impact assessments. The kind that uh, require ethnographical uh, uh, research, ethnographical surveys. What does that mean? That means that if Nico is going to expand, part of the archaeological work is not just to walk the land and dig a shovel pit, but the archaeological company is going to go out and see any families connected with the Nico? Hey, would you mind? Can I interview you? You know, the the Manamko. You know, the you know. What, can you tell me about this area? That is just as important as a survey, walking the land and measuring a laddy stone and and you know counting how many lusong you find. What is missing is the voice of our people in these reports. So we should make it part of the process. We should call upon these cultural impact assessments, not only for Manamko, but also cultural practitioners. You know, because sometimes they're not, you know, the oldest, but there's a pescadot, there's a, you know, talazeru that knows that reef. You want to get their story too. Somebody who's learning medicine, but, you know, not Manamko status, right? You're going to go talk to them too. But the bottom line is getting their voice. So I highly recommend that we start including these, the people's voice in these reports that are coming out. And finally, going off of that, we hear about the uh, public, uh, the allowance for public testimony for whatever programmatic agreement and, and this and that, you know. Okay, that's fine. But at the end of all of that, this programmatic agreement as part of that whole process, where's the summary? Whatever archaeological company or if the military did it or the developer did it, you know, you're going to call everybody to come to that community center or to this building to state what you, what you want, what you don't want. Where's the summary? 500 people came to testify. 400 were against it, 100 were for it. These are the reasons why they're against it. These are the reasons they're for it. It's like people are wasting their time to talk if these people putting together, you know, in the case of the programmatic agreement, you know, the summary and the recommendations from the people. Because we all know what everybody wants, you know. So it's almost like check marking a box. Okay, we, we allowed everyone to come and talk, 
and then you put that away and nobody sees, okay, what are the numbers? <laughs> you know, because the numbers are not going to lie. Um, and, and that also goes for these other archaeological reports and also cultural impact assessments when you talk to people. It should say, Nico wanted to, to expand, the Hilton wanted to expand. We talked to everyone. Um, in addition to our survey, this is what we found, but also we spoke to six Manamko and three fishermen, and they are for it, they are against it. These, these are the reasons why. And that's allowing our people to have a voice. So again, I, 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 I would like to elaborate more uh, some other time, you know, offline, talking about the ways to make a burial council work, um, about how to implement consultation, better consultation, and then the dozen or so things, other things that can be fixed in the process regarding the protection of our, uh, our ancestral remains and our, uh, our cultural sites. This has gone on for too long, so uh, thank you for your time, and uh, yeah, appreciate it. Thank you, Dietrich. You know, my apologies, I have someone on Zoom from Hawaii and because of the time difference, we'd like to give her an opportunity to speak. So can we please transition to Zoom? And Nick Santos, are you there? Yes, there you are. Go ahead and uh, state your name, name for the record, please. Hafidi, um, Chair Nelson, um, Speaker Terlahi, Senator Perez, and other, hopefully other senators that are also watching. Um, my name is Nick Santos, and um, I'm a daughter of Guahan, born and raised in Guahan, um, of uh, Filipina, Filipino descent from the Northern Philippines. My parents came from the Philippines in the late 1960s, uh, emigrated to Guam, and um, met there, got married there, had us there. Um, and we've buried our mother there in Guam. So Guam is home. And um, I have two daughters, um, both of whom are Filipina Chamoru. And I have two grandchildren that are also Filipina Chamoru. So um, I give that background because um, Guam is home for my family and our families. And um, I feel a responsibility and an obligation to um, pass on knowledge that maybe I might not have received from um, ancestrally via my parents, but I, um, I have done the work with the government. I've worked in the government through the legislature for about 10 years, and I learned a lot from the people. And clearly this public hearing and the public hearings you've had um, over the years uh, contain so much knowledge and information. And every time um, new people come forward and also people who have continuously spoken for generations have spoken forward. And so the knowledge is always changing and growing. And um, I'm very humbled to hear um, these stories over and over and over again, they always sound very different. Um, but these are stories that I want to be able to pass on to my children and my grandchildren as well. Um, and so I'm very grateful to, um, to be part of this community, even as it is in struggle right now, um, especially around burial protections and sacred sites. And um, I, I applaud all of those who have spoken already, um, and I, I um, just express my gratitude for the knowledge that you've shared. Um, I think uh, I am living currently in Oahu, and um, I actually just really appreciate uh, the speaker just right before me, um, uh, who has been able to really put words into the practices here and share that the practices here are pretty um, just amazing 
uh, and they struggle here too. Kanaka Maoli here in Hawaii struggle. Um, they have very solid burial protection laws, um, but even, even with that, uh, I think that's the nature of protections, right? Is that it's always in negotiation and it has to be negotiated. And um, more than anything, the people are, um, are the ones who should be neg negotiating um, that. So here in Hawaii, I am um, developing an expertise in historic preservation and cultural resource management. Um, I'm learning from the people who I believe know a lot and they have learned from um, uh, the Maori in Aotearoa and they have also learned from other Pacific Island communities. And so um, I feel very fortunate to, to be here, to hear their stories, right? Because these stories are actually what really move us and propel us forward. Um, and uh, I just want to share a line um, that was that is in the burial protections legal primer here in in Hawaii, and it it's from the Kanaka Mali, and it just says, um, "One's homeland provides the fundamental underpinning for self determination and serves as a source of identity. By reburying and protecting the sanctity of the EV." Kanaka Maoli strengthen our ancestral foundation, maintain the interdependence between past and present, and reinfuse the land with mana essential to sustain our ancestors, the living and future generations. Therefore, the care of Ivi Kupuna is the highest form of sovereignty the Kanaka Maoli can practice. And this is from cited from Baldoff and Akutagawa. And I share that um, as a resource because. Uh, um, we know this from story that Auntie Hope has shared just earlier, how, what she shared today, but she also shared at the recent event um, held by Pratehi Latexen, Sainam Asi to PLSR for that very, um, very moving and inspiring event um, held in honor of um, uh, the sacred sites and, and the, the remains, the Chamorro remains. Um, but we learn from these stories that our ways of protecting and protections are not the same as those who propose to protect us. And I think um, those kinds of stories are really important to remember because it helps us to get critical perspectives and to help change what we don't want and what we what's not um, fitting for us. Uh, I think earlier in the in the oversight hearing, um, you know, there was reference to loss of access, and um, loss of access is is very significant when we read a portion of the federal regulation, thirty six CFR Part. 800.11 C1, the authority to withhold information. It reads, shall withhold from public disclosure information about the location, character, or ownership of a historic property when disclosure may cause a significant invasion of privacy, risk harm to the historic property, or impude, impede the use of traditional religious site by practitioners. When I read that, and when I hear that that is what is holding us back from having cultural ceremony or having these kinds of discussions with the people who um, are supposed to help us protect, uh, it, I almost have to ask, you know, and do these regulations feel right for us? Do they really make sense to us? And, and if they don't, then we have to find ways to make them work for us. Right? It's supposed to protect us, but ironically, uh, it's working against us, right? Who does this regulation favor in this instance? What is the impact of that action and the consequences of that, right? These federal regulations, they get used against the people. They limit access, especially in situations where access is already limited. And damage to historic property 
we just heard that archaeological studies are the form are, are most destructive. So, you know, I, 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 we can't just take these regulations at face value, we really have to question them. And I think questioning them at multiple levels is important. Everyday local people, um, to government leaders, to those working and negotiating at the level of the federal government, those levels of conversations and those exchanges of stories are critical to the movement, right? And so I really um, just continue to encourage us to have those questions and, and see and feel if they make sense. If they don't make sense in our, in, in our bodies, then we have to do something about it, right? We have to, to make a shift. Um, I just want to share maybe two more points here. Um, Section 106 trainings and webinars are available um, through the ACH, ACHP websites, but I think um, these trainings are also offered by the Historic Hawaii Foundation and I'm happy to provide those links um, to you, Chair Nelson, um, so that you may disseminate those um, as you see fit. Um, but these are Section 106 trainings um, that are offered by the Historic Hawaii Foundation. And what's really useful about them is um, you get a sense of the stories that, that Kanaka Maoli will share and their experiences with, say, for example, um, cultural impact assessments and um, you know, various parts of the process that might make sense for and be helpful for us as we continue to do this work. So I'll send that. Um, the other thing that's also really helpful, and this is very recent, um, and forgive me if I don't pronounce this, um, I'm still learning, but um, Kali Uokapa Akai Collective Report. Um, this report just came out maybe last week, it was launched last week. Um, there will pro there's probably a recording of it online, but it narrates a public understanding of cultural resources uh, management in Hawaii. And it's very comprehensive. It covers um, even um, to the extent the protection, burial protections for Ibi Kupuna. And I think it's really, really useful for our community. Um, so I wanted to share that with you. And, um, and I just want to emphasize again, the importance of why indigenous worlds, worldviews matter. Um, that the importance of seeing and experiencing the whole context. And I think we've been saying this already, um, uh, that cultural landscapes are not just about specific, specific areas, but they consider um, the world view, right? The perspective from which um, there might be a burial site or, or a, um, an ancient village, and it considers all directions um, above below to our left and to our right. And so I think those are the kinds of perspectives we really need as we continue to do this work around um, burial protections and um, honoring of our, our ancestors. So Kaina um, Maasi and Dakal um, Asalamat, I thank you from my family to all of yours. Thank you, Nick, and we'll be looking forward to the documentation that you'll be sending us. Um, now I'd like to call on Ramona Nelson. Please state your name for the record. Kapiti, Senator Nelson, Speaker Terlahi. Oh. All right, again. Hafide, Senator Nelson, Speaker Terlahi, and Senator Perez. Guahu si Ramona Nelson, and I will be submitting my written testimony voicing my concerns. However, I would like to use this opportunity to read the testimony from Cara Flores as she is unable to join us this evening. To Duas Masi, Senator Nelson, for facilitating this round table, and to Senator Perez and Speaker Terlahi for taking the time to be here. My name is Cara Flores, and I'm the director of Duk Duk Goose, I mean Duk Duk Goose Inc., or Nihi, a culture-based media nonprofit. I'm also indigenous to Guahan, a granddaughter daughter, and mother. I speak here in all of those capacities. For the past seven years, 
our nonprofit has produced media to affirm Chamorro and broader Micronesian identity so that our children would know that who we are and what we have is a gift that we are given as indigenous peoples, as Micronesians, as Chamorros. I am here on behalf of our children as well as our ancestors because I believe that the recent desecration of multiple burial sites tells our children that our lineage is of no value and certainly of less importance than the hanging coffins in Sagara, the pyramids in Egypt, or Arlington Cemetery. I am deeply concerned about the message that this sends to our children about their worth and the importance of our own lineage, our sacred sites, and our history. While I'm not an archeologist, and this is not my area of expertise, I do have questions that I feel obligated to ask. One, does this process mirror what happens in other places, for instance, in Hawaii, when a community expresses opposition? Two, and if, in spite of the community opposition, the project continues and ancestor graves are discovered, what is the procedure in other places and how is it different than what has and continues to happen here? Three, over the years, I've become quite familiar with the process of engaging our community in which we express our concerns and opposition, and it is documented as participation. But then, plans move forward anyway. Is there a tally of testimony and comments in support or against these activities? And if so, what impact, if any, did it have on the activities that are being carried out today? Four, based on the desecration or discovery of our ancestors' graves, have any official recommendations been made by the unnamed archaeologists or by any other consultant or expert? And could such serious destruction and disrespect have been avoided? Thank you for the opportunity to ask these questions. On behalf of our ancestors, my daughter, and all our future children of Guahan, I hope that we will pause to understand the weight of what has been done and to take every action possible so that our children will know that who we are and what we have is beautiful and worth protecting. I end with this quote from our very own Julian Uggen and his recent book, The Qualities of Perpetual Light. He says, Fatalism is the idea that we are powerless to do anything to change our circumstance, to change the world. What does this mean? What does this look like? More importantly, what does this do to children? I cannot think of anything more terrifying than children who do not believe the world can be changed. Thank you. Thank you, Mona. We are now going to call on Kyle Orden. Sayuna Mahase, and thank you. Um, to everyone here today in person and to everyone on Zoom, uh, it's incredibly inspiring and a privilege to witness all of your testimonies, uh, your knowledge, your perspectives, and your identities through your experiences in life and your descendants. Thank you to the legislators for holding this space for us all here today and fulfilling your powerful and respectful duties to hear the people and to fulfill what they request. Thank you. My name is Kyle Reardon. I am an anthropologist. I hold a Master's of Arts degree in this field of study. I am also a professional archaeologist. I've experienced work in this field in various scales and various contexts from research-based archaeology, Section 106 archaeology, and historic preservation. I have studied this field and realized that over time, when you look throughout history, it has changed quite a bit and it continues to change. And it will continue to change because that is how science operates. In order to become more accurate and better practiced. 
And that is what I would like to talk to you all about today, about the change that should occur in this field, especially in the context here in Guam. So I come here today in front of all of you distinguished guests and faithful listeners to talk not about the reactionary change that has occurred time and time again, reactions to tragedies and atrocities carried out in the name of science and in the field of anthropology, but to talk about proactive change, things that should be instilled before these tragedies occur. So I would like to make three points of suggestion and request for addressing the overall lack of consultation and the continual disenfranchisement of indigenous people around the world and the Chamorro people through the erasure and destruction of their cultural heritage in the name of science and archeology span and preservation. My first point should be of highest priority in every context of heritage preservation and archeology span on Guam. Every archeological site with any cultural significance, including village sites, burial sites, agricultural sites, etc., whether they be historic or prehistoric, must be given in perpetuity to the rightful and willing stewards, the descendants of the ancestors from which these sites have emerged. In this context, this is the Chamorro people, the families who hail from these sites and can still, to this day, recount their lineage which ties them to the land that they have been displaced from. My second point should be of high priority to all stakeholders involved in the process of conducting archeology span and historical preservation on Guam. <clears throat> Every research design that involves archeological investigation for any reason, whether it be based in research, development, or preservation must include an ethnographic component in order to accurately collect and interpret the contemporary viewpoints of various stakeholders, especially those of the Chamorro people. Rather than conducting consultation at the end of projects, this assessment is a critical first step in the process of building a research plan that involves archeology, span and it must be considered of the utmost importance. This is something that has already been discussed by various people here today, but it cannot be restated enough because of the amount of times it has been overlooked. Every research plan that involves archeological investigation to any degree, whether it be pedestrian surveying, sat site mapping, subsurface scanning, or destructive excavations, once it is written and remains tentative, it must be approved and consented to by Chamorro descendant landowners of the locations under investigation. This research plan must not only be made fully transparent to the Chamorro people prior to, prior to its initiation, but investigators must provide options for the full array of post-field investigation analyses that can be performed. This includes osteometric analysis, biometric analysis, radiometric, genetic, spatial analysis, et cetera. As expertise in archeology, span there is a whole swath of various analyses that can be conducted. And we must inform Chamorro descendants that what those analyses actually entail and what they would produce in terms of data and interpreted results so that they can give informed consent. Funding and personnel should be provided to match the requests of the Chamorro so that these analyses can in fact be conducted in a concise manner. My third point should be of highest priority to the sustainability of Chamorro self-determination in the context of archeology span and historic preservation on Guam. There must be more avenues created and funding generated 
to educate Chamorro people in archaeology and historic preservation, not only in their own history, heritage, and language, but so that they can become practicers and be the holders of knowledge and practice within this field as it is done here in Guam. So that primary schools and universities on Guam can increase the likelihood of producing Chamorro archaeologists who be can become in various capacities responsible for conducting investigations on the island. Chamorro people must be at the front line of planning for historic preservation sites. The request for enlistment of places on the Register of National Historic Places must be taken seriously and made sure to not be undermined. Whether it be through a committee, commissioners, or roles within preservation agencies, there must be numerous checkpoints put in place to assure that ethnographic assessment and consultation with Chamorro descendants is continual, th continual throughout the process of conducting archaeological investigations or preservation projects. This responsibility must include that all stakeholders involved with projects are made aware and adhere to the wishes of the Toronto people. There's been a lot of discussion already about some of the actions that are taking place right now in terms of preservation and archaeological investigation. Um, some of my reactions to what has been talked about already, um, I've quickly written down, and I would like to say a, a couple things in closing before I uh, give the mic over. Um, one thing I would like to say is that uh, memorial plaques have been discussed um, already for, to commemorate uh, some of the burials and places of cultural significance. Uh, all the, I, I would like to say, although this is a um, respectful sentiment, I believe that it is extremely minimal in terms of the preservation and stewardship that can be generated from archaeological remains to suggest that as a compromise is minimizing to the abilities of the Chamorro alive today and their heritage. In place preservation is another topic that's been discussed. Um, in place preservation sites should not include only the places where sensitive materials are found, but the land in proximity to it should be protected from the development that is not approved by Chamorro descendants. Rather, preservation should be centered on Chamorro stewardship for the continuation of ceremonial purpose and their respective practices for preserving their heritage. These oversight hearings are wonderful and give a tremendous space for democratic voice, but much more can be done before having to come together in this space and air our grievances and discuss all of these things that we are discussing today, which are very important. They can be circumnavigated through increased consultation and ethnographic assessment. The programmatic agreement which states standard operational procedures, the methodologies which are enlisted because of these laws should have Chamorro interests placed first. So this includes in situations of data recovery, preservation projects, reburials, repatriations. This is law that I'm talking about. And it's not just with the programmatic agreements here in Guam which need to change and need to hear the voices of the Chamorro people, but it goes higher up to legislation on national historic preservation. We talk about a lot of sensitive materials here, a lot of sensitive experiences. The emotion is very heavy. I would like to just close out by saying that all materials discovered, biological or cultural, they should remain there where they are discovered because they are not being discovered. 
They're already known. We need to hear the people who know about them already. They need to be consulted. Their wishes need to be adhered to. Thank you very much. It is an honor and a privilege to be with you all today. Thank you, Kyle. Now we're going to transition into the Zoom testimony. And the next individual we're calling is from former Senator Will Castro. Is he still here? Hi, good afternoon or good evening, Senator. Thank you for coming. Can you please just go ahead and state your name for the record? It's nice to see you. Half a day, Madam Chair. Guahu si William Castro. Zanu ha hu attend the estina meeting para i in it nun la hing wahan. Forgive me, Madam Chair. I uh, was actually reserving testimony uh, to be prepared for the committee. Lo, uh, while I'm here, if I could just uh, enter a few remarks uh, for the record. Si ju smasi gehilo ki komitea para estino opportuna dot na be discuti no mas preciso. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, who attended the Estino uh, meeting, para i inet nun la lahing guahan. Mentres mengagi hit wini si Jus Masi Talu, Senadora Nelson, then uh, Senadora Perez, and Terlahi, who um, so popati i karere mizu, uh, para i bidan mizu, na takfet na i entresi mansamoru, so nun kontoru nun imanyata guahan. I just want to say thank you again, Senator, for. Uh, extending the privilege to enter a few remarks and listen to the very passionate testimonies and some of which are very technical uh, about such an important topic. I, on behalf of the Young Men's League of Guam, I appreciate and support your path, your passion, and all that you're doing to look out and advance the interests of this great Chamorro nation and the families of Guahan. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's good to see you again, uh, Telena Hafadi. Senator Nelson, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Castro. And then uh, also in Zoom, we have Hannah L. Rabadula. Is Hannah here? Hi, half a day. Hi, half a day. Okay, so I will be brief. Um, again, thank you everybody for holding the space for us to discuss our concerns um, about the desecration and removal of the Chamorro ancestral remains from sacred burial sites. Uh, my name is Hannah L. Rebajulia. I'm a Filipino settler of Guahan. Um, and again, I also want to honor that this round table is being held in the land of the Chamorro people. Um, and I am here in Kapwa and in solidarity with Chamorro people who are in support of protecting their ancestors' remains and their sacred lands. Um, so I'll be brief. I really just wanted to speak out against the degree of entitlement and utter disrespect that the US military has when it comes to the culture and values of others. Um, and that's preaching to the choir. Uh, that's definitely something that we've talked about throughout in the last um, hour. But I think for those who may not see the point or the value in all of this because um, the remains are just, you know, be because the remains that are being moved are just quote unquote remains and quote unquote ancestral kind of indicating that we are somehow more distant to them um, because of the connotation that they're ancient or they're old. Um, some, something, because I think, you know, we could get really technical, but um, for others who might not be in the field, like, like myself, sometimes I think of it as um, someone taking an excavator to Arlington National Cemetery and digging up those remains and somehow putting them in boxes somewhere, right? And I guess some people might reason, well, that's hallowed ground dedicated to American heroes, but well, these sites are hallowed ground dedicated to Chamorro heroes. Um, and so with the US military disrupt and desecrate where their ancestors are, you know, where their ancestors are resting, will they put them in a crypt? Um, would they ever desecrate a proper cemetery for military buildup? Um, and also, what is a cemetery but a sacred burial site, 
or what's an ancestral burial site but a cemetery, right? Um, so another thing that I, I ask, and these are mostly questions, not really any recommendations, but um, questions is what makes the ancestral Chamorro burial sites in Guam any less valuable than that of Arlington National Cemetery or a city or a town or a village cemetery. Um, and I think at the end of the day, it's all about racial hierarchies and that's been brought up already. It's racial hierarchies, it's privilege, power and oppression. Um, and I am a clinical community psychologist in training um, and I study a lot about the psychological effects of oppression. A lot of the times when that oppression is internalized by the people that leads to higher rates of suicide, it leads to higher rates of substance use, um, depression, violence. Um, and so I think, you know, just taking all of those things into consideration and again, re-emphasizing that what the US military is wrong and dishonorable and that the Chamorro people who were buried at those sites, you know, it doesn't, just because we're existing in a time and space that's different from the Chamorro people who were buried at those sites, it doesn't render them as any less valuable or any less deserving of rest and peace um, respect and, and honor. So, Sisus Masi, Maraming Salamat. Thank you guys for your time. Thank you very much for that testimony, Hannah. We appreciate it. And now I'm going to call on Rokin Shonko. Okay. Go ahead and state your name for the record again. You'll probably say it better. Buenas and half a day. Guahusi Rokin John Kichijit Shonko. My mother is Rolene, my grandfather is Roki, my grandmother, um, her name was Juanita. She passed away um, this past October under a full moon. And I just want to share a story um, that I share with her. When I was just a few weeks old, um, my mother had gotten sick and she just like needed to nap. She was just out. And so I fell asleep as well. And Something just told my grandmother to watch me as I slept. She saw my chest rise and fall, rise and fall, and he just stopped. In a panic, she was like, oh my God, she's not, he's not breathing, he's not breathing, he's not breathing. And luckily my uncle, we lived down the street, knew CPR, um, and here I am today. When I came back home uh, around this time last year, when her son was setting, Over the years, every time I've returned home, my island just got smaller and smaller and smaller. And it's not because I grew bigger, um, but because lands were taken up left and right, eaten up by foreign powers. My grandfather was one of the families who had land in the Texan. Um, and although we were liberated, quote unquote, after the end of the war, the war to be Chamorro was not over, and it continues to be to this day. He spoke about how he hunted, how he fished, how he grew, all on the land. And in the time between his experience and mine, our forests have gone silent, and so many trees have fell. As a weaver coming home and seeing coconut trees without their crowns, it reminds me that death is all around, but also that is life. Life can be found all around as well, as long as we choose to love and protect it. As we laid my grandmother to rest, I couldn't help but think about if or when those bulldozers would come for her, if they would come for myself as well. I may not know their names or be able to speak to them, but just like my grandmother, I owe my life to them. I owe my love to them. Sainama Asi. Again, my name is Rokin. Thank you. Thank you, Rokin. And then we'll call on um, Hula. Go ahead and state your name for the record. Buenas and half a day. My name is Edward, aka Pulan. 
And let me just say, Sezus Masi, Men Senador, for hosting this and for having just the mental fortitude to be able to listen to so many of these heart-wrenching testimonies and even very technical ones as well. It takes a lot of, you know, I wanted to run for senator, but I don't, I'm reconsidering that now. But the main thing, though, is that what I want to talk about, and who prometi hamsun natres, golf sadik esti, is that main recommendation. Because the, again, I'm not an archaeologist, I'm not an expert in historical uh, preserve, but it seems like if Shippo is the public one, is the mediators, gives us this information, consults with the military, then it's supposed to be accountable for us, which makes that previous request and that rejection very questionable. But that's besides the point which is the Burial Council. That Burial Council bill, which uh, Tia Hope Cristobal, then, you know, he also was advocating. I also strongly, strongly, strongly advocate that as well. And, you know, politics aside of trying to figure out, oh, who, who gets to be on the Burial Council? Who should it go to? Do you need a degree? F forget about that for now. What's important is just, having this in place, just pass it and figure out the details later because the more we wait for this, the more these situations will just keep happening. Magua could be a repeat again and so on. So that's why all I will say again is just please just prioritize this burial council and pass it, you know, maybe write him, put him in charge of it or something legislated somehow, but, but yes, that's one of my main things. And then just a, a minor thing as well is that according to the Protehi Latex and pamphlet or that image going around, there's about 3,000 ancestral remains. So I just have a little concerns about that as well, about the procedures, about how can we implement the, those procedures as well? Because if there's 3,000 ancestral remains, my question is, where are they all at? Are they all just scattered in offices? Are they all in a centralized location? Are they just stored in boxes? You know, are they in temperate controlled climate conditions? Or, you know, what, what are the issues facing, facing us that we can't rebury these or that we can't properly have ceremonies for these 3,000 ancestral remains? So, you know, if someone could, you know, provide an investigation on that or something, that'll be very great. And it's probably have to do with resource or money and that. And, and yes, yeah, so, and the whole consultation again with Shippo and with what happened at Cap Magua, that was, that was incredibly just sad. And I don't know if that was a violation of the pragmatic agreement. Was Shippo caught for that? Or did they somehow define it because Cap Magua wasn't in the, the pragmatic agreement as one of those places that needs to be preserved? I'm not sure what's happening there. So maybe another suggestion is, is have a, specific a task force or a PR with Shippo that's able to communicate this information to the public, that's able to summarize this going on. Because man, that Shippo, that, that must, wh whether it's conflict or interest or not, that must be an incredibly, incredibly stressful job. The fact that you're this mediator to the public and then the military, oh my goodness. So maybe that the ship officer, maybe they need more help or something like that, which again goes back to the burial council, which will help alleviate that pressure by adding in that indigenous voice and, and helping them out. And yeah, that's pretty much all I got to say for today. Again, Dunklu Sidhu Samasi, Toru Hamsu, Esther. Thank you. And then now we're going to transition to our Zoom testimonies. Okay, there's a... Uh... Hi, Manika. You're welcome to give testimony. Thank you for waiting, and thank you for everyone that has been waiting here and in Zoom. Jesus Masi, Senator Nelson, Speaker Chirahi, and Senator Perez. Um, it's, I really wish more of the senators were there tonight. Um, it's, it's kind of uh, a shame that uh, we are constantly coming to these hearings to argue why we need to protect the remains of our ancestors. We're, we're constantly coming to these hearings talking about how we need to protect our water, how we need to protect our endangered species. This is another level, while, while it's a great engagement in our community, it's another level of violence. Um, it's, an, it's kind of criminal that we have to come to the legislature 
and argue for the protection of what we hold most sacred. Um, unfortunately, I, I got to listen to the panel that came on before us. And, you know, I have to say that I would like for everybody at the Historic Preservation Office and in the government and then the governor's office and in the government of Guam to quit deflecting to NAFTEN. Every single time we come together to talk about the desecration at Mogwek and on the Northern Plateau, um, we're constantly hearing references to the NAFTAN. We, at least we're getting the NAFTAN done and all the other um, ancestors who've been desecrated and disturbed will be laid to rest. That's, that's just a distraction. Uh, we, we know that we have so many ancestors who've been disturbed for so long who need to be uh, laid to rest again. And, and what we're looking at though now is this massive destruction up in the Northern Plateau. And I think it's really important uh, that we stop referring to it as Camp Blas because when the military renames these sites, it's part of our erasure of our history, of our culture, of our connections to these sacred places. It's also, I would say, um, a dis it also dishonors the family name and the clan um, who might not agree with their ancestor being attributed to a site of violence and destruction. Um, we need to call these places by their by their real names, Finnegadzen, um, Matsanao, Mogwek, Tokwek, Sabana and Fading, Tailalu, Haputo, Arunao, and Apsin, Latex. And we need to call all of the villages by their names. And we cannot allow the military to continue to erase our connections to these places by renaming them. Um, so the hearing today, you know, was it was it was also really unfortunate that uh, acting Shippo did not come, and uh, it's good that another follow up hearing will take place with Shippo Pastor Luhan. But um, um, sorry, before I continue, I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Nate Flores. I'm a member of Pratella Texan Saber Tidian, and I'm here tonight to provide testimony with two of my sisters, Jessica Nangalta, who actually had to step away uh, momentarily for another Zoom meeting and Maria Hernandez, who's there, I believe at the legislature waiting to testify. Um, and I'm going, I hope I'm not too repetitive, you know, but I wanna thank all the speakers who went before me. We share a lot of the same sentiments. Um, you know, on April 10th, Prate La Texan Saver City and had a ceremony um, for the community and it was under the leadership of Sina Hope Cristobal and we're very grateful for her guidance in that process. But we did it because um, what happened in the ceremony for, with the ceremony with the, the military and Shippo held in November um, is, is a complete um, disservice. It's a it's a complete it's criminal really because it doesn't it when we when whenever this happens our grief our um, we as a collective need to come together and and decide how we are gonna handle the destruction and the desecration. And that process um, really kept the community of Guam out. And just because, you know, Shippo decided that it was enough, that it was okay. And, and for just the governor and members of Historic Preservation Office to be there with the, with the military, for them to think that that was enough is not okay. And, and I, and you know, man, many of the members of Pratella Texan strongly feel that, you know, there is a conflict of interest in the Historic Preservation Office. And I'll reiterate the concern brought up by Joni Kangakur earlier that um, Shippo couldn't come today because, you know, Shippo has been activated um, because Shippo's in the Air Force and there's a very, a very clear conflict of interest there. Um, I, I, I want to uh, talk a little bit about, about Mogwek, uh, you know, or Mogwa um, and the 12, um, the 12 remains that are, are meant to be in place in this very small area with just a sign to talk about Sabana and Fadang and a small exhibit. And, and this is just, this is not enough. This, this is a, an, a, a, an injustice for all of the destruction that has taken place. When you look at the small area um, that, that, you know, and you even hear what uh, Acting Shippo said about, you know, replace, uh, leaving the remains and then covering them with dirt, there's definitely a level of um, detachment uh, that's alarming. It's, it's alarming and it's painful to hear because Shippo is supposed to represent the people of Guam. But, you know, aside from that, um, we, you know, we, we, 
we feel like all of the burials need to be returned to the place. There's, a, there's an importance of being laid to rest in your clan lands. And so removing the remains and putting them in boxes and in shelves and in storage is a complete violation of that. Um, and we have to stop treating the Department of Defense like a regular prop, a private property owner. They are not a regular private property owner. They are a huge institution, the world's uh, most destructive, it's one of the world's most destructive institutions and biggest polluters. And um, giving them, you know, all of the privileges, as, like they are private property owners, is is, is extremely criminal. Um, the, all of the destructive language that's been used this entire time, fragments, temporary settlement. Um, it, they really undermine that this was a huge complex of, of villages and people that lived throughout that whole coastline and in the northern part of Guam. And it also, you know, so what they're doing is they're actively erasing and denying the cultural landscape of the place. And so, you know, we have to look at that language for what it is. And, and, and it's similar with the language in the programmatic agreement. This language is racist and it's dehumanizing. It purposefully removes, tries to remove by using archeological language, it purposely tries to remove us from our connection to our ancestors. And um, it, you know, in terms of the PA, the new PA, SHPO is not involved in any of the preliminary, um, the preliminary processes. Um, and, and, and unfortunately, the public is supposed to contact the Department of Defense to become a consulting party, but you know, as someone mentioned earlier, uh, the public uh, cannot uh, submit such a request to Department of to the Department of Defense if the public doesn't know what is happening on on at, at these sites. The public, the community of Guam, also cannot choose any of the professionals who are going to work with the military in this process. We cannot even choose any of the methodologies or the new technology that's available that's less destructive, other than data recovery, is what as somebody mentioned earlier. Um, the programmatic agreement is extremely vague and what it does is it skews section 106 law to privilege the priorities and the work of the military. It privileges military design over um, our ancestors because so basically the, the, the military has the has the advantage if they decide that their design cannot be changed. It doesn't matter. None of the preservation laws matter because they can decide to move our, the, the remains anyway. And so um, those are a lot of the, the main points I, I wanted to make today. Um, but, you know, in, in terms of our recent history, a recent experience with Prate La Texan Saver City, and we've been really pushing a lot of folks to try to comment um, on the programmatic agreement memos. And it's been extremely um, disappointing because um, when we ask the Historic Preservation Office for studies so that we can prepare to do these memos, they'll tell us that the studies are actually property of the Department of Defense. So then we need to submit an official request to the Department of Defense to get any of these studies. The th when we do that, the Department of Defense basically tells us we need to FOIA them to get these studies. And so this is just another level of the violation of our right to free prior informed consent. And this is one of the violations of human rights and indigenous rights that was mentioned in the communication from the United Nations to um, the administration of President Biden. Um, the, the United States had 60 days to reply to that uh, communication. And that 60 days has lapsed. And, and we in Pertela, Texas, um, we met with the governor last Friday and we tried to convey a sense of urgency that we need an official communication to come from her office to the president. And we were told that, that she would make that communication. And so we're waiting on that. But the 60 days has lapsed. And, and the United Nations has asked for six actions and, uh, for, from, from, um, from the Biden administration. And those include um, for the US to provide information or comments um, on the allegations regarding military buildup in Guam, the destruction of indigenous Chamorro sacred sites and cultural resources and associated environmental impacts. Number two, for the US to report what measures have been taken to ensure that the Chamorro can engage in cultural and religious practices and protect our cultural heritage in the view of growing militarization. Number three, for the US to provide information on steps taken to respect, protect and fulfill the rights of indigenous peoples to life, health, food, safe drinking water, our right to a safe, clean, healthy, and sustainable environment in Guam. Number four, for the US to provide information on current or planned measures to ensure the participation of Chamorro people in all decision-making affecting our community to obtain our free prior informed consent to projects that affect 
our lands and territories and to support and promote tomorrow's people's right to self-determination. Number five, information on progress achieved in the cleanup of Superfund sites and whether there are other sites in the process of being identified as Superfund. Number six, information on any measures taken by the state to initiate a dialogue with the Chamorro people for the resolution of past human rights violations and to prevent further right violations. However, moreover, the letter from the UN Special Rapporteurs urged that all necessary interim measures be taken to halt the alleged violations and prevent their reoccurrence while the United Nations anticipated a reply from President Biden. Unfortunately, 60 days has come and gone and there has been no response yet. And we have asked the governor to, to, to get involved. And what this means is, is, is we don't know if, I mean, these, if there's been a halt to stop further violations from happening. And what we in particular the Texan interpreted that as is a halt, a pause to the destruction, to the continued, um, to the to continued desecration. Um, while the United States responds to the to the request of the UN Special Rapporteurs. And so, um, you know, we're hoping that to get that communication from the governor soon, we're hoping to get some response from the Biden administration. I know that that was on the agenda. So that's why I'm making note of it now. Um, how, and um, I think that that's, that's all that I wanted to share um, with that. But the this, this, this situation is urgent. Um, anytime there's a call for comments for these PA memos, the, the destruction has already been done. Um, it, as Rick Paris said earlier, um, we this system is set up to make us feel hopeless and powerless. And uh, we, we, it, we have, many of us in the community, I mean, we're all here tonight. We are, you know, spending our time here because this is such an important issue for us. And before this, there have been several roundtables, there have been several public hearings, there have been many, many thousands of comments. We have, have almost 25,000 signatures on our petition of, of people who don't want this destruction to occur. And so, um, you know, in terms of what can be done locally in policy, uh, you know, we we need we need to definitely strengthen a way for Shippo to be in, to be there for representative from the from the people of Guam to be there at all times, not just when the Department of Defense says it's, says it's okay based on the programmatic agreement, and also um, the the Department of Defense should not have a final say. We the people of Guam should have a final say over you know what happens to the remains of our ancestors. Uh, every day I got to go by the University of Guam and see the site of the new repository. And it's just heartbreaking that this is where this is where the sacred remains and, and the, the traces of the lives of our ancestors, thousands of thousands of years old, will stay in boxes. Not for us to learn anything, not for us to feel a connection to them or to honor them, but to stay in a storage facility. This is criminal. And we should not have to come down to the legislature every few months, every, every year to say, we don't want this. We don't need, we don't, we, you know, this is, this is not okay. And again, I'm just going to close with that. I thank you so much for the time and for the opportunity to testify. Um, and we cannot, uh, again, the sign, the small sign, the small exhibit, it's not enough. It's not enough. Um, thank you so much, Susan Smossi. Thank you, Maneka. And the speaker gave you a thumbs up. <laughs> um, and so now we'll come to face to face. Maria Hernandez, you want to give testimony, please? Thank you for waiting. Buenas and half a day, Cesar Masi, for holding this important hearing. Uh, my name is Maria Hernandez. I am a member of Protehula Texan Save Ritidian. I'm also a descendant of Ritidian land owners. I'm a daughter of Guahan and a mother of three. And also for the sake of not being repetitive, because I feel like maybe me and Nate hang out so much, our <laughs> testimonies are identical, so I'm gonna kind of uh, omit some of what I have uh, written here. But I came here today to speak on the very pr problematic way build-up projects have moved forward over the years. The system is very, very flawed and is not built in our favor. Most of the projects have moved forward without the DOD and Guam Historic Office providing adequate opportunities for meaningful dialogue. The online comment process is flawed. 
Uh, we, we, every time there's a comment period open, we have community members coming to us who say they feel intimidated by the process. They are asking for our templates to submit. It's just, um, there are so many people who are passionate about this issue. Uh, something that I've heard over the years is that whenever there's an issue surrounding Latexan or burial sites or military projects, these are some of the most attended public hearings. So, you know, there is a vested interest in the protection of the sacred here on Guahan. So, despite being denied these opportunity for, opportunities for dialogue, our community has consistently and resoundingly spoken out against the clearing of more than 900 football fields. And I always use that figure to give people a mental image of the, of the destruction um, of pristine native land and the desecration of our burials. And our lawmakers have also spoken out through the passage of two legislative resolutions, Sitsus Masi, uh, calling for a pause to the construction, yet it has moved forward. And I wanna share the narrative that has been shared and reshared by the DOD with regard to these lands that are being occupied for military projects. Military spokespeople and officials have spoken with media in the past, um, specifically, I want to quote a July 2019 article uh, where a military spokesperson described um, Northwest Field as, quote, it's not a sacred, untouched landscape, end quote. Military staff described Talala as an area that, quote, has been damaged by war and invasive species, was bombed by American forces when it was occupied by the Japanese during World War II. It was a battleground during the liberation when a base for B-29s then a base for B-29s to bomb Japan, and that most of the artifacts found during survey work were remnants of war, end quote. This was how that area was being described for a long time by island media and at public hearings that it is not sacred. And we were hearing that it was a temporary settlement in public hearings, which a lot of people mentioned here. And here we are years later, burial after burial being found outside of what was initially surveyed, and we're learning that you know, they're they part of a larger Chamorro settlement, or multiple settlements. And despite this new knowledge, they are being cleared quickly so military projects can move forward. And we've, uh, over the years, have spoken to experts who have just, we're, we're um, you know, not in the field of archaeology, but have spoken to experts who have described the archaeological process as fluid. Um, and when, when burials and settlements are being found, and then the previous ones have been cleared already, then we no longer have the ability to put the puzzle pieces together for a broader understanding of our history. And another thing that, want, that we want on the record is that we hear from uh, build-up proponents who justify the violence by saying that we should be grateful for new findings uh, to learn that, that we now know more about our people. But, you know, we consistently say that our ancestors are not being treated with the respect that they deserve. And we want to emphasize that archaeological technology in this age has, has um, they're able to use laser technology and to, to make discoveries without even putting a shovel in the ground. So we are not grateful for the desecration of our ancestors. Just want to put that out there for all of the proponents that continue to throw that critique out there. Our people deserve more, our ancestors deserve better. And um, I think it's also important, we, we haven't gotten uh, more information about the SHPO's decision to withhold the information from the public about the recent burials. Um, so Carlotta Leon Guerrero has released information um, about the recent burials, um, but she initially re uh, rejected the request and she referenced a statute that, quote, protects information about the location, character, or ownership of historic properties from public dis disclosure, when disclosure could result in an in invasion of privacy, damage to historic property, or impede the use of a traditional site by practitioners. Um, I just want to say that withholding information like this, it loses, really loses public trust. Um, and then after reading the initial ar archaeological report that she shared, there was nothing that seemed to match those three criteria. So we as a community, we need to see the full study 
to see what, you know, maybe she did not, she chose to not disclose. Uh, Manik already spoke about the conflict of interest at the Stark Pres Preservation Office, but I want to talk about the conflict of interest involved in having a DOD archaeologist handle these sites. Because of this conflict of interest, these archaeologists may choose to not be as thorough or accurate, accurate in their surveys. Many archaeologists, they view culture through scientific lenses. So they see an archaeological site as, um, you know, one would see a scientific, you know, phenom in a petri dish. While they may have the intent to preserve the culture, their methods and theories are purely products of Western ideologies. Chamorro people, we are interested in knowing more about our ancestors, but we're not obsessed with a scientific study of human skeletons, and we venerate the bones of our ancient ones. We have respect for our ancestors. They deserve ceremony and respect and to be treated with sanctity. And preserving the scientific inte integrity of artifacts, human remains, and historical sites, they don't necessarily preser preserve the culture of these entities. So we fight to preserve our cultural heritage associated with these sites or artifacts. And so this is why our uh, SHPO's office must continue to push for sites to be pre preserved in place in order to maintain a culturally viable future for our native people. And people already spoke about the burial councils, but I just wanted to touch on some of the requirements for those who serve on these councils. Um, the, they must represent native Hawaiian interests. They must be members of the Hawaiian community. They, ha they have a, must have a strong background in native Hawaiian um, culture and specifically must be well informed concerning native Hawaiian traditions regarding burials and burial practices. Um, and then, you know, people already spoke about how, you know, when, when burials are found, uh, the council is immediately contacted um, and they provide protection for burial under law. And I wanna reiterate my support for the um, legislature, pushing forward legislation that establishes a council like this. Um, another protective law, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, um, ensures uh, that funded, federally funded agencies must return American and Native Hawaiian human remains, funerary objects, and objects of cultural patrimony to line lineal or cultural descendants. And there is a $100,000 fine for violations of this act. I think our fine here for violations of um, historic preservation law is, is um, just within the thousands, I believe. So we need to strengthen the regulatory capacity of our agencies and our protective laws. Um, Nick talked about um, how the DOD is allowing ground disturbing activities before providing opportunities for public comment. This has happened on numerous occasions. And so we need to go back and look at all of the PA memos to see how many of the sites have been cleared before they've been opened up for public comment. Um, so specifically under the 2011 PA, quote, ground disturbing activities or other actions with the potential to affect historic properties. Um, for all projects, they must, um, DOD must comply with a three-step process for identifying the historic properties. And the first step is providing pre PA memos to the public, um, and we're concerned that DOD is not providing these memos prior to construction. There has to be something that the legislature can do to ensure that public comment periods occur before the sites are cleared. It happened not only with recent um, sites that were open for comment, but the three um, cultural heritage sites eligible for the National Reg Register of Historic Places um, that was cleared, um, for the, for the marine base that um, we, only, we only learned by looking through the PA memo and kind of putting puzzle pieces together. The language wasn't clear in the PA memo that the site had already been cleared. So we had to like go through three other different process to, processes to figure out if it was intact. That needs to change. And um, I don't know if anybody mentioned this already, but 
Um, the 14 million designated for the repository, um, that's to build the repository, but it's gonna cost the people of Guam an estimated 1 million a year to maintain. And that's a question of whether Guam has the funding to maintain that kind of facility. And uh, I personally am against a repository because it just sends the wrong message that we prefer our artifacts in bags and boxes compared to you know, them being preserved in place. And I just wanna end by saying that so much destruction has occurred and all along we've known that these the, the sacred nature of these sites that are being used for built-up projects. And I'm, I'm glad that the public now knows the truth, that you know, they should not be described by their colonial past, that they are not just temporary settlements, that these are entire settlements that are being cleared. And now it's a matter of what we as a community and our leaders are gonna do with that truth. So we need, to support the legis uh, we need support from the legislature with regard to the UN communication to Biden. Um, and our leaders, all of our leaders, I'm glad the governor uh, agreed to write a letter, um, but all of our leaders need to echo um, the request of this letter. And um, as recommended by the UN, we urge our leaders to engage with the DOD and. JRM to pause all activities in sites of impacts to prevent further impacts to our lands and waters until we receive an official response. Sitsis Masi. Thank you, Maria. It's always good to see you. We'll now transition into the Zoom meeting. If I will ask uh, Signora Rufina to give testimony. And then Kelly Muska from Alaska. Senor Rufina, are you there? Yeah, buenas tardes. I just wanted to, uh, uh, I'm, I'm wanted to thank you, uh, Senator, uh, Speaker, and um, Sabrina Paris. You guys are awesome. Um, please hold, keep holding on to the fort and, and the help of our people, our ancestors, especially coming from um, the language and our language and culture, uh, our children in the school system, especially now where I am, my position now, they don't deserve this. They need to know what happened in our history long time ago. And we should, uh, we should have a culturally relevant history books in our classroom that tells them about our past. So I'm here and I'm you know, waiting. I can wait all the way up to midnight to hear lots of beautiful testimonies. I, I, I really appreciate Nick from um, Sanchez from Hawaii that she's staying on. My daughter is here and I'm pretty sure she's already sleeping. But thank you so much for your testimony. And I was hoping that we hear, we see a lot of our senators. I'm encouraging uh, Nick to please run for a senator in the chat. Um, recruiting senators. We need people like you guys. We need your voice in our legislature. We need a change for Guam. And I'm really in support with what you guys are doing, Senator Talina, uh, Speaker um, Perlahi, and Sabina. Please keep doing what you're doing for Guam. Sidus Masi. Sidus Masi, Senora. And now we will call on um, Kelly Muska. Oh, there you are. Can you state your name for the record, please? Hafiday Senators, I am Kelly Jean Mosca. I'm 16 years old and currently attending George Washington High School. I'm speaking on behalf of the youth of these islands and Inafa Malik Youth Heritage Program. We appreciate your consideration and support during this time to give us the opportunity to express our concerns for our cultural resources, for the physical remnants of our history and heritage and therefore our future. I believe it is our right for the youth to be educated about our culture as it helps inform the decisions we make moving our island forward. Growing up, I would be excited to go to Retinian and learn more about where my ancestors lived. I was so proud to be there and learn, so proud. As we walked through the land, I remember all of us praying paying our respects to our ancestors who lived there. It breaks my heart to think that anyone would not have the same respect I have for the people who have created the island for us, for me, 
for my people, our people, the indigenous people of Guam and the Marianas. I think of how I would feel if it was my own grandparents or close family member being removed from their grave. I feel the same hurt when I have to think that our ancestors would be removed from their resting place. We have questions we want to be answered. We are the people of this land and we deserve the most, the utmost respect. What is the example that we are setting for our children? How can we teach our youth to respect our elders when our sacred land and ancestral remains are blatantly disrespected by outside forces? How can we exercise our inherent rights as Tatsautanu? How do our rights and our inheritance come as second priority to the military and their mission? Is there no middle ground? Senators, do you have the answers to these questions? I ask now a very similar way, a question I asked at the hearing for safe water. Who will be held accountable for ensuring our identity, ensuring our rights to cultural heritage, to our history? Again, I encourage you, our leaders, to help me find the answers to these questions, to draft and to pass policies and regulations to ensure that I'm still able to turn to the land and embrace the culture that is in front of me. We ask that these remains and precious pieces of our past, at the very least, be returned to our people, that we may learn and grow from the new knowledge and information that, be, that can be gained from this experience. We refuse to believe that our past is destroyed or damaged. Instead, we ask respectfully that it be restored to its rightful owners, us. Please consider us, the youth. Consider our connection to the land, our connection to our culture, and how important these resources are, how important the respect for these resources for these resources are to us. Our understanding of path helps us pave our way into a prosperous future. In closing, I would like to present to you all a video put together by the youth of Guam. Did you guys want me to screen share or did you guys have the video ready? Go ahead and share your screen. Okay. I believe you'd have to give me the authority to screen share. AV, can you please give them the rights to uh, do a screen share? Okay, thank you. Just give us a minute. This is a message from the youth of Guam. We are the Menhoban, we are the future. Water is the defining element that sets the Earth apart from the other planets in our solar system and allows for all life forms to flourish and thrive. It is scientifically proven that the proposed firing range above the northern aquifer of our island will be a huge hazard for our people. So please protect the land and the water, the youth is our future. Protect the land and the water, the youth is our future. Protect the water. Protect the land. Protect our land. Protect our air. Protect the man Hoban. Protect our clean water. Don't let us be the victim. Do not ignore what could have been prevented. Help us live a life of happiness and good health. Wait, oh my God. 
We are the future. 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 Thanks for allowing me to share that with you guys. Thank you, Kelly. That was a beautiful video. We appreciate that. And now, is that all? Okay, we're done? Okay. We have completed our um, testimonies. I just want to do a recap of what we received this evening. I feel that, um, I believe that this was a very productive roundtable hearing. We had a lot of input from our community um, for areas regarding all of the responsibilities of our State Historic Preservation Office and our Guam Historic Preservation Officer. And so just to recap and, and summarize this, some of the things that our office is going to try to work on or will be working on is for addressing how are we going to move forward for monuments who, um, where burials are found um, within the island of Guam, not just limited to the military, uh, guidelines for government accountability, um, for desecration of remains, also the opportunity to ask the governor if the people of Guam, if the public can have the be given the right to pay respects to in Magua where the burials were found. Um, also see if we can acquire a list of the burial grounds that have been found. Okay. There were some other measures that were asked. Um, preserving Haputo, Latexan, Hinapsan, and creating historical district zones. I'd like to thank um, Ms. Hernandez for that input and Mr. Dave Lotz, really shedding light with the public on the incidences that occurred involving the MIT PA. And that will be discussed in the oversight hearing to come um, to ensure that those that are the, the, the SHPO or working with the office have adequate training on section 106 to ensure that the regulatory requirements for the SHPO as a classified position is announced and people are, are given the opportunity to apply, not giving an appointed position for a classified government position. From former Senator Kelly marsh Titano, greater transparency, uh, calls for public comment um, to include maps, and details of the activities taking place um, and in prov being provided concise information to the people of Guam, also requesting additional expertise and consultants rather than just relying on the few and to improve the modern and to modernize the process of the Historic Preservation Office. For Ms. Joni Kerr, ensure that information is distributed and passed out to the community, documentation that it, what is being done on the sites be sent out to the people. From Mr. Perez, um, to continue the um, assessments and acknowledgements of the activities taking place of our underground aquifer system um, also to have a breakdown on the type of chemicals being used on the base, the type of activity being used. From Dietrich, considering a burial council consultation, um, improving consultation and including cultural impact assessments such as ethnographic research. From Nick Santos, um, who's also going to send us additional do um, documentation on Hawaii's burial grounds and um, improving access to these areas. 
And then from Kara, which is read by, by Mona, um, we have to answer those questions. Kyle, um, an archeological research design, prioritizing and acknowledging that the rights be given to the Chamorros in archeological finds and um, improving and defining clearly in place preservation. From Hannah, um, I, I wanna thank her for this. This is very true. We, we see it in, in other uh, cultures where there's a, um, a lack of cultural identity and it impacts society as a whole, especially for the indigenous people. So I wanna thank her for the input. And Monika Flores to be able to acknowledge what our, where our Chamorro villages are and what their true names are. Um, and thank you for speaking on the United Nations Special Rapporteur and also to address this repository issue at UOG. And then Maria, thank you for um, acknowledging that our public comments um, must be asked for before the site um, is disappeared or the site is touched. And Kelly, th thank you for that testimony that you gave, especially the video. I think it worked out well that you were the last one. So we could be reminded that um, that is our duty as leaders, um, that we protect our island and our resources and our culture for the future generations to come. We cannot just think about ourselves and our time here now, but we must also look out um, we must, look, we must also look out forward and see the impact for, for those that are coming after us, who are our, our children, our grandchildren, our nieces and nephews, and our brothers and sisters. So this time, my speaker, do you have any remarks or anything you wanna say? Just to say thank you to those who came today and um, gave their stories, shared their expertise, shared their um, inspiring, uh, courage, and I want to thank those who over the years have consistently done this and reminded us and, in, you know, motivated all of us and inspired us because it takes all of us. It takes all of our voices together and we need to, you know, not be afraid to not just hold you know, developers accountable for destruction, but to look at ourselves and our processes. So I thank the chair for having this hearing so that we can do that. We can look at our processes, we can look at whether they're really achieving the purposes that were intended. You know, are we protecting, you know, um, our culture? Are we doing that? Are our laws adequate? Are our leaders adequate? Are our officers in the government adequate? Are they doing the best that they can do? So I think um, I'm, I'm willing to state that we all agree that we can all do better. And that, um, so I just want to very much thank those who, who are able to take the time and to make that very clear to show for our history that we did not give up, we will not give up, and we care, and we are going to take care of these things to the best of our ability in the time that we have for future generations. So thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thanks again to those who testified tonight. Thank you, Speaker. Senator Perez. Do you uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, um, and I just want to thank you for your commitment throughout these terms. I believe it was three terms since you first introduced the, the first resolution to prevent the, the destruction. So thank you for your continued commitment, and I want to thank the community. I mean, it's been said that when the community leads, the government follows. And I think we're in really good hands to see such a great group of, of community members that have come out today uh, discuss various ways in which we can address and become agents of change. I think that's really important. And we know uh, from the various testimonies that this preservation does not fit us. And it's high time that we take action. And I, I stand with my, uh, I stand with the community, I stand with my colleagues. Um, I'm committed to doing this work to, to make 
the processes fit us and to protect our land and our ancestral burials. So I want to thank the community for their persistence and their leadership. So it's Zuz Masi. Thank you, Senator Perez. And I'd be um, remiss if I didn't mention uh, Jeremy for his um, presentation of the prayer and his, uh, his chants. It was, it was very beautiful. And uh, this is important for us as tomorrow's to also connect to our language and, and be able to express ourselves. It is who we are, it is, it is how we identify ourselves and it is what makes us great. And I'd also like to thank Nancy Hope, Hope Cristobal for coming out today, um, you know, and, and, and giving testimony even over 30 plus years. She has been doing it, she has been the forefront and she has been an amazing community leader for all of us. And it is like those and Senor Rifina that who are coming forward, um, they really remind us that we need to start taking action and never giving up and continue to, continue to, uh, to make things better and to continue to improve. So it is now 8.11 in the evening. What do we say, adjourn? We will now adjourn this community roundtable hearing. Thank you. <laughs>